Good morning. It's Friday, uh, September the 27th, and uh, let's take a few minutes and, and look at uh, Moustakis and where we are with uh, this particular way of perceiving um, the world around us as qualitative researchers, uh, being aware that uh, the terms that we learned from, say, Chapter 2 about the noema and the, no, and the uh, noesa, noesis, the noetic perspective. The, um, the noema might be the, um, the social context, the, the group, um, looking at um, the interaction or watching five people standing together. Uh, what is the noema that we see there? What is, our, what is the noetic perspective on that? Um, the noema is defined by the social interaction that is going on among those five and between those five people. Something that we'll do in one of our uh, practice when we do uh, non-participant observation where we're observing say five people and then you, using social, sociograms to diagram the uh, magnitude of conversation between two or more of those people and the directionality of the conversation as best we can describe it without hearing anything but just watching the interaction and the proxemics, how close one and the other are to each other, and, um, and their kinesics, their uh, body language, um, deriving what we can from those kinds of observations in a non-observation or non-participant observation. So uh, the noema appear to us, but the interesting thing about it is, is that our, our, there's a certain intentionality which uh, chapters three and four talk about and Moustakas, which one I like to talk about mostly today. The intentionality is determined a lot of, to a great extent by our noetic perspective. You see five people and you assume it's a family. Um, or you see that noema of five people and you assume it's friends. Or you see that noema that's really not there of five people that's a crowd. Um, crowds have their noema. But how much of what of that noema that we see is, is in fact there, and how much of it is a function or reflection or determined by the intentionality that comes from our own noetic perspective? Oh yes, I know what that is. I see it, I identify it, define it, and I move on. But we may have missed the whole point of that gathering of individuals. Our noema may not ex at all match their noema. And that's really what this is all about. Um, what we're doing in this, uh, this semester is adjusting our own noetic perspectives to allow those noema that are out there in the world uh, to appear before us as though we had never seen them before. That's the, that is the idea of the transcendental phenomenological method. Uh, allow those noema with the epoche remove our noetic perspective and allow those noema to appear before us. Or say, allow, allow the noema to appear before us and then as we open our eyes, if we were to do it that way, and then we were to focus on them and see them as if they were for the first time, then we have phenomenologically, of all of the phenomena in the world around us, phenomenologically reduction, we've reduced our perspective to just that noema and then we allow our imaginary variation to say, well, indicators of interaction suggest that these five people are family, or whatever you might see in your imaginative variation. But the purpose here is, is that removing your noetic uh, framework and uh, your blueprint of reality, uh, the intentionality that you have for negotiating and navigating the social world, perfect, perfectly acceptable. Because if things work right in a society, it's just not the case, our, noe our noetic perspectives coincide so that we can navigate together and understand the basic principles of how we interact with each other and how to navigate through different circumstances because there's a certain normal way, uh, array, a certain normal array of perspectives that represent the common noetic way of interacting, engaging one another, and navigating social reality. We have outliers, people out on one end or the other, that we might describe as peculiar uh, or as um, deviant, 
sometimes way out deviant, where they the they come under the come under the law. You know, in other words, they may break a uh, break a law and uh, do a crime. But we know people that are uh, deviant in a sense. Um, most men don't wear beards, so I'm a deviant in that sense in my behavior. Um, I I never I hardly ever go anywhere without wearing jeans. Church class coat and tie look a sound. I wear uh, I wear jeans. Seldom do I wear anything else. So probably I'm a deviant. So there's a lot of deviation in this world in terms of uh, things. But for the most part, the deviation ranges uh, in a very narrow scale, so that the assumptions of our navigation of the world are pretty equivalent and give us success in our interaction. So when we're talking about uh, the noesis or noetic perspective, the noema, it's very much like what we were talking about in the er on chapter two and in chapter five, the uh, trans uh, transcendental phenomenological methods, the epoche, to remove our noetic perspective and see that noema as it is, uninfluenced by our own intentionality. And when they talk about the intentionality here, it's a couple of ways. When we when we see or hear uh, our apparatus, our sensory apparatus, there's an intentionality. Uh, you hear a sound and you assume it's a duck. Uh, you smell something, it's raspberry pie. Uh, you see something, it's a tree. We've talked about trees. So uh, there's a certain intentionality here that uh, when we see these objects or smell these objects or hear these objects or whatever they are, we automatically intentionally know what they are because our noetic perspective um, filtered through our ears or through our eyes or through our nose or through our taste or through our touch to find those things for us because that's what we have learned. Ah, raspberry. We know that to be raspberry as opposed to blueberry. But if those words were not in our language, we wouldn't know what it was. We wouldn't have any idea. So the, the trick of this is then, and, and you'll see as you go through these notes and some of the quotes that Moustakas uses in chapter 3 and 4. <laughs> the real trick of this is if you can do it, it's an extension, <coughs> perhaps in the extreme of the epoche, and that is to see that split second, absolutely split second, when you see, when you, when you see before you realize it's a tree. In other words, before you name it, in your mind before you give the intentionality ah oh, that's a tree <laughs> it's not it's not an easy thing to do but that's a practice and uh, this is all philosophical I suppose in a way but it has very practical implications in being a qualitative researcher it's like we've talked about I do I've done qualitative work in the community and community health assessment the last thing I want when I go into a neighborhood uh, as a community health practitioner is to go to a community meeting with the noetic perspective, the intentionality of what I think is going on in that community. And, um, and then with my intentionality and my noetic perspective, filter everything that is said so that it is either in agreement with me or it is not. And uh, whereas what I should be doing is removing that and listening to that voice as if it were for the first time with no preconceptions, no biases, no nothing, uh, letting it spring forth naturally in front of me. And then I can use my imagining variation to begin to come to terms with it, but to allow it to speak without my noetic perspective. Listen to the noesis of the person in front of me, rather than listen to that person speak the noetic intent that I expect them to say. So uh, that's really what we're about here. And when we do ethnomethodology, uh, we talked a little bit about this last time, you do ethnomethodology, you breach the noema, you breach your noetic perspective, you're surprised and you surprise them by doing something peculiar like standing towards the back wall of a elevator which is not what one would normally do and um, you breach that noema and by breaching noema it, it creates opportunity for discussion for people to say well why did we construct this noema in the first place? Um, now, you wouldn't do that in an elevator, we talked about that, but, um, you know, turn off the, uh, stop the elevator and sit down on the floor in a cross-legged uh, lotus position and sing Kumbaya and 
work your way through why did we make this assumption about elevator behavior. Now I'm talking in a weird way in the extreme, but if in, in the way that ethno methodology is a piece of science, you would breach and then have that conversation. Now we see a lot of inadvertent breaches, intentional breaches actually, like we talked about before, breaking line behavior and that sort of thing. So, but that's all about uh, looking at that noema and breaching it in order to bring the noetic perspectives in play. And then those participant and non-participant observations we'll talk about when you do the next assignment in the sociogram. Describe that uh, noetic or that noema and um, and then the participant observation is from the inside with your noesa looking around, noetic perspective looking around and the um, non-participant is your noetic perspective from the outside looking in uh, trying to define that uh, noema. So all of this is an exercise and um, that sort of thing. So I think uh, that's really what um, chapters 3 and 4 are um, all about. Um, there's some discussion in there about um, ethnomethodology in particular. Something that I found uh, stuck in an email a year or two ago and I just passed that forward to you in these notes. Um, we had a little bit about um, the assignments I think I mentioned in here. Um, the value on page 43 that Moustakas talks about of the phenomenological perspective in science. Um, and it's really what we're talking, what we just talked about, and particularly in the social sciences. Um, like on the uh, fourth floor here in Moye is the Department of Psychology, and they use Moustakas' book. Uh, I've got it here somewhere. Uh, Moustakas' book and their uh, PhD program when it's a counseling program and so when um, the way they apply it is that when the, the counselor is speaking to the client the counselor is trying to remove his or her own noetic perspective and listen to the noema being described by the client and then helping the client to adjust the noetic perspective of that individual in order to change the noema of the context in which they are so it has that kind of a practical application and the uh, psychology department uses it quite well. I've I had the privilege of uh, being a, uh, a reader on, a, on uh, dissertation committees. In other words, I'm the outside person. Three of them are, three of the, three of the faculty members are inside the department and they call me in sometimes as the outside person. And I'm always fascinated when they call me in. I'm always saying yes when it's got some kind of phenomenological um, aspect to it. Um, I put in here one in, in an example that was personal. I had mentioned a minute ago about my beard. A few years ago, I've had this beard since my sister was married, and I don't remember now when that was, uh, 1970, I don't remember when I was, 75 maybe, something like that. So I've had it quite a while, 30 years, 40 years maybe. and. Um, I grew it because that day, my, in those days, my beard grew so fast. I shaved in the morning I, uh, for the breakfast. I shaved again for the wedding, and then I shaved again uh, for the reception. I thought, well, that's it. I'm not shaving again, period. And so I didn't. And uh, for maybe 20 years, I didn't shave. Sometimes it's gotten long. And when I worked out in the community and social work uh, in, in South Texas, hablando español, people would, uh, I became known in Pearsall as El Barbón, the big beard and uh, it was fun. But uh, one winter I decided to shave it off just to see what would happen. Or not so much what would happen, just see if I wanted, didn't want to have it any longer. Well of course as soon as I shaved it off, in a matter of two or three days I realized why I had it, which is I don't like to shave. I'd much rather trim periodically than get there every morning and you know drag a blade across my face. The interesting thing that happened over those two or three weeks, um, it'd be, I would be walking around here on campus and uh, People never, people wouldn't realize. They would say hello to me, or they would say, "Hmm, Steve, there's something different about you, but I'm not quite sure what it is." So their noesis, their noetic perspective, saw me with a beard, even though I didn't have one. The intentionality—it's like seeing the tree that doesn't exist, or no longer. You know, maybe somebody came along and cut the tree down, and you walk by and you assume the tree's there. Now we've. I'm sure everybody's had those kinds of situations where you assume something to be in place when it no longer is. 
but that one that I put in the notes is just sort of a personal illustration. How people who know you well, that may not be your, they don't, may not know you intimately well as significant others in your life who hopefully would realize you no longer have the beard, but people you work with, you know, colleagues, people you see every day, you're in meetings with, uh, didn't see it. Well, they didn't see uh, that I didn't have the beard any longer. And uh, I'd have to point it out and go, oh, yes. So anyway, that's just an illustration of what we're talking about, that you can walk into a, uh, in a, into a neighborhood and see it in a way that it's not really, because you're governed by your noetic perspective. So you can get the, you know, I'm hammering around in, on all of this, but so it's, you get the point of what uh, these chapters are all about. They're giving you the conceptual, uh, background to this, the epistemological, if you will, how you see the world, and then sort of the ontological in terms of how the world is constructed. The world is constructed by consensus in the thesis of phenomenological method. What we see is what we construct by consensus. Uh, the tree is there because we all agree that it is a tree and that it is there. And it's not to say that if we said there was no longer, we no longer agreed the tree was there, that the tree would disappear. Um, but then again, maybe. Who knows? But uh, it's a old thing that my grandfather used to exercise us little grandkids about when we lived up in the woods in Maine. What would be the sound of a tree falling in the woods if there was no one there to hear it? So whew, we stewed on that for years. Some of us would say, well, if there's nobody there, there'd be no sound. And others would say, a bird would hear it. And then somebody would say, well, what if there's nobody there? No creature with uh, sensory apparatus uh, would it make a sound. Oh, we spent literally years stewing on that. My grandfather would sit around the fireplace in front of us in the uh, in front of the fireplace in the evenings and ask us that question. And we all it was almost a Zen thing, right? Like he was our Zen master, and uh, what's the sound of one hand clapping or something? Uh, which is an interesting to think to think about in terms of what we're doing here. Uh, thinking in terms of the unexpected, thinking in terms of paradox, uh, thinking in terms of how we construct the reality around us, and as qualitative researchers we do not want to do that. We want that reality around us to present itself in its own voice. Kind of like the optical illusions that I have in this. You know, what do you see? What do I see? The first one, um, uh, what do you see? And um, the second one, uh, you know, is it a woman that you see? Um, what do you see? The, the second one, is it a vase or is it two faces uh, facing one another? Optical illusions are kind of fun because in a way life is about that. Uh, not to say that it has no substance because indeed it does. But <coughs> a lot of what we think we see is an illusion. We may be expecting things that are only from our own minds and hearts, but are not really out there in, in reality in some way. Uh, some might call that delusion, but we want to get on the psychological end of this. But there are optical illusions in, uh, in social behavior and social phenomenon that uh, what is there is uh, not what it seems, shall we say, and, um, and allowing it to present itself so that we can see uh, what it is and hear its own voice. Um, in here is intentional. I, we spoke a little bit about horizons inside the noema. People inside the noema see horizons that bound their noema. From the outside, as observers, we see those horizons as boundaries. And as researchers, we want to try and penetrate those as best we can without disrupting them. Uh, if we're a participant, we automatically change the boundary and horizon because we're now an ingredient in the mix. Um, but how can, we, how can we do that, say, as a non-participant, get inside that noema through the, indicating, the indicators of the uh, behavior of the individuals and see the horizon from their perspective um, and not just simply the boundary uh, from our perspective? Um, on down in page 56, 57, 58, talks about intersubjective validity. That's, that's what it is. We don't always sit or, Sometimes you've been in situations that, do you see what I see? Um, that's intersubjective validity. Uh, you saw it, and you want to, wow, I, 
um, you ask somebody sitting next to you or someone else, did you see that too? And that gives you a particular noetic perspective, validity, because somebody else saw it also. So uh, much of how we create our social reality is inter intersubjective validity. We have a consensus. You go around the mall uh, to the right for the most part. In England, you go around the mall to the left for the most part. Uh, we drive on the right-hand lane for the most part. Over there, they drive on the left-hand lane for the most part. All these kinds of things build navigational instructions, shall we say, give some inner subjective validity to how we navigate uh, the world. That's physical world there, a mall and a highway, but how we navigate our own inner, our own social interaction independently of any physical reality around us. So um, I think that's pretty much um, all I want to say. Um, I th uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I have a number of uh, quotes in here about um, that of Husserl that I've introduced, and uh, and then the phenomenological, philo more philo philosophical stuff that Moustakis talks about. The word that I use in here, I sort of created on the fly the other day, or when I first did these, is to de-intelligibilize the world, <laughs> so that what we do is we intelligibilize the world uh, with our noetic perspective. We give it social construction, and uh, then we can navigate it. And we have intersubjective validity because we're all doing it the same way. So there, are, for the most part, the assumptions work because we all are doing following those same assumptions, even though they're not out in the forefront where we can see them, but they're all in the background making it work. So what we want to do is de-intelligibilize. Uh, don't make the world so intelligible, intelligible from our noetic. Let the world present to us its own intelligibility, should we say. So uh, I hope uh, this is interesting stuff to talk about, I think, and uh, hopefully it opens up your horizons a little bit, gets you thinking about noemas and uh, noetic perspectives. Indeed, you have to in order to be a, what I would consider and most would say, would be a good qualitative researcher where you're going in doing your work, uh, responding to the voice of others rather than uh, expecting them to respond to what you expect, shall we say. So, uh, this is Friday for me. I don't know when you're going to see this video. Uh, it's Friday the 27th. Weekend's coming up. It's supposed to be slightly cooler. Chance of rain, at least uh, here in San Antonio. I hope there's chance of rain where you are. And um, a weekend coming up. Uh, Y'all be safe out there. And uh, talk to you next week.